Graphic Audio. A movie in your mind. Possessed of an unnatural and legendary hunger, the Reapers have come to Earth to establish a new order built on the harvesting of enslaved human souls. They rule the planet. They thrive on the scent of fear. And if it is night, as sure as darkness, they will come. (laughs) Graphic Audio presents E.E. Knight's Vampire Earth. Narrated by Ken Jackson. Performed by Tim Getman, Richard Rowan, Scott McCormick, Thomas Pennick, Katie Foster, Jonathan Watkins, Dylan Lynch, Michael Glenn, Christopher Graybill, Stephen Carpenter, Terence Aselford, Michael John Casey, David Coyne, Peter Stray, Nanette Savard, Johan Detweiler, Laura Quinn Anderson, Chris Rowan, Greg Reinfeld, Mort Shelby. Vampire Earth, Book One, Way of the Wolf, Part One. Northern Louisiana, March, the 43rd year of the Curian Order. The green expanse, once known as the Kasachi Forest, slowly digests the works of man. A forest in name only, it is a jungle of wet heat and dead air, a fetid overflowing of swamps, bayous, and backwaters. The canopy of interwoven cypress branches shrouded in Spanish moss creates a gloom so thick that twilight rules even at midday. In the muted light, collapsing houses subside every which way as roadside stops decay in vine-choked isolation, waiting for traffic that will not return. A long file of people is moving among moss-covered trunks, At the front and rear of the column are men and women in buckskin, their faces tanned to the same weather-beaten color as their leather garments. They carry sheathed rifles, and all are ready to use their weapons at the first hint of danger. The guns are for the defense of five clusters of families clad in ill-fitting lemon-colored overalls at the center of the file. Patches of brighter color under the arms and along the inner thighs suggest the garments once glowed of vivid optic yellow and are now faded from heavy use. A string of five pack mules follows behind them under the guidance of teenage versions of the older warriors. At the head of the column, well behind a pair of silent scouts, a young man scans the trail. He still has some of the awkward gangliness of youth but his dark eyes hold a canny depth. His shoulder-length black hair, tightly tied at the back of his head, shines like a raven's feathers even in the half-light. With his dusky skin and buckskin garb, he could be mistaken for a native resident of this area three centuries before, perhaps the son of some wandering French trapper and a Choctaw maiden. His long-fingered hands wander across his heavy belt, from holstered pistol to binoculars, touching the haft of his broad-bladed parang before moving on to the canteens at his waist. A scratched and battered compass case dangles from a black nylon cord around his neck, and a stout leather map tube bumps his back from its slung position. Unlike his men, he is hatless. He turns now and again to check the positions of his soldiers and to examine the faces of his yellow-clad dependents as if gauging how much distance is left in their weary bodies but his restless eyes do not remain off the trail for long. If they come, they'll come tonight. Lieutenant David Valentine returned to that thought again as the sun vanished below the horizon. He had hoped to get his charges farther north of the old interstate before nightfall, 
but progress had slowed on this, their fourth day out from Red River Crossing. He and his wolves shielded 27 men, women, and children who had hazarded the run to freedom. The families were now adapted to the rigors of the trail and followed orders well. But they came from a world where disobedience meant death, so that trait was understandable. They'll come tonight. If they had been traveling by themselves, the detachment of wolves would already be in the free territory. But Valentine was responsible for seeing the Red River farmhands brought safely north. Four hours ago, the yellow-clad group had crossed the final barrier, the road and rail line connecting Dallas with the Mississippi at Vicksburg. Then Valentine had pushed them another two miles. Now they had little left to give. It was hard for Valentine to quiet his mind, with so much to think about on his first independent command in the Curian Zone. And quieting his mind, keeping life signed down, was literally a question of life and death with night coming on. Being a wolf was as much a matter of mental as physical discipline, for the Reapers sensed the activity of human minds, especially when fearful and tense. Every wolf had a method of subsuming consciousness into a simpler, almost feral form. But burdened with new responsibilities and with night swallowing the forest, Valentine struggled against the worries that shot up like poisonous weeds in his mind. The Reapers read life sign better at night. His charges were giving off enough to be read for miles, even in the depths of the Kasachi. If his wolves' minds were added to the total, the Reapers would home in on it like moths drawn to a bonfire. A call from ahead broke into his anxieties. Valentine raised his arm, halting the column. Garnett, one of his scouts, gestured to him. Water, sir, in that little holler. Looks safe enough. Valentine spoke loudly enough for the column to hear. Good. We'll rest there for an hour, no more. We're still too close to the road to camp. The faces of the farm families brightened, in contrast to the deepening night, as they drank from the spring trickling down the side of a shallow ravine. Some removed shoes and rubbed aching feet. Valentine unscrewed the cap on his plastic canteen, waiting until the families and his men had a chance to drink. Wolves dived for cover behind trees and fallen logs. The yellow-clad families, who lacked the ability to hear the bay, shrank together in alarm at the sudden movement. Sergeant Patel, Valentine's senior non-commissioned officer, appeared at his elbow. Dogs? Very bad luck, sir. Or... Silence! Sergeant, who knows this area best? Patel's eyes did not leave the woods to the south. Maybe Lugger, sir, or the scouts. Lugger pulled a lot of patrols in this area. Make her people lived west ways. Would you get her, please? Patel pointed to and brought up Lugger, a seasoned veteran whose limber, sparse frame belied her name. She held her rifle in hands with alabaster knuckles. Sir? Lugger, we may have to do some shooting soon. Valentine spoke in an undertone, trying not to alarm the unsettled civilians. Where's a good spot for it? Her eyes wandered skyward in thought. There's an old barn we used to use on patrol, uh, west of here, more like uh, northwest, I reckon. Concrete foundation and uh, the loft's in good shape. How long to get there? Under an hour, sir, even with them. Lugger jerked her chin toward the huddled families. Their yellow overalls now looked bluish in the darkness. Valentine nodded encouragement. Solid foundation and a big water trough. We used to keep it filled with a rain catcher. Mm. No help in that direction. Mallow is more to the east, but it'll have to do. Mallow, the senior lieutenant of Zulu Company, had remained in the borderlands with a cache of supplies to help them make it the rest of the way to the Ozark Free Territory. Valentine considered something else. Think you could find the rendezvous at night? God willing, sir. Take a spare canteen and run. Ask Mallow to come with everything he can. Yes, sir. But I don't need my gun to keep me company. I think you'll need every bullet you got before morning. Lugger unslung her rifle. Valentine nodded. Let's not waste time. Tell Patel where to go, then run for our lives. Lugger handed her rifle to the senior aspirant, spoke briefly to Patel and the scouts, then disappeared into the darkness. Valentine listened with hard ears to her fading footfalls as fast as his beating heart. 
Please, Mallow, for God's sake, forget about the supplies and come quick. As his men dusted the area around the spring with crushed red pepper, Valentine approached the frightened families. They found us? The speaker was Fred Bruggen, the patriarch of the group. Valentine smiled into their dirty, tired faces. We heard something behind us. Could be they cut our trail. Could be a dog got the wrong end of a skunk. But as I said, we have to play it safe and move to a better place to sleep. Sorry to cut the halt short. The refugees winced and tightened their mouths at the news, but did not complain. Complainers disappeared in the night in the Korean zone. Good news is that we're really close to a place we can rest and get a hot meal or two. Personally, I'm getting sick of cornbread and jerky. He squatted down to the kids' level and forced some extra enthusiasm into his voice. Who wants hot cakes for breakfast tomorrow morning? The kids lit up like fireflies, nodding with renewed energy. Okay, then. Everybody take one more drink of water and let's go. Valentine filled his canteen, forcing himself to go through the motions nonchalantly. The aspirants somehow got the pack mules moving and the column trudged forward into the darkness. With curses matching the number of stumbles brought on by confusion and fatigue in the night, the column continued north. Valentine led the way. A rope around his waist stretched back to Sergeant Patel at the tail end of the file. He bade the families to hold on to it to keep everyone together in the dark. One scout guided him, and a second brought up the rear in close contact with two fire teams shepherding the column's tail, their phosphorus candles ready. If the enemy was close enough for their dogs to be heard, the reapers could be upon them at any moment. Valentine resigned himself to the orders he would give if they were set upon in the open. He would abandon his charges and flee north. Even a few wolves were more valuable to the free territory than a couple of dozen farmers. Valentine, continuing on that grim line of thought, decided that if he were a battle-hardened veteran from the campfire stories, he would stake the farmers out like goats to a prowling tiger, then ambush whatever took the bait. The death of the defenseless goat was worth getting the tiger. Those win-at-all-costs leaders from the old world history books would never be swayed by sleepy voices repeatedly asking, Is it much farther, Mama? Valentine hurried the column over his shoulder. Close up and move on! Close up and move on! Wolves picked up tired children, carrying them as easily as they bore their weapons. They found the farm exactly as Lugger had described. Her wolf's eye for terrain and detailed memory of places and paths would astound anyone who did not know the cast. The barn was a little bigger than Valentine would have liked, with only 22 guns. No time to be picky, not with reapers on our trail, he thought. Any place with the trees cleared away and walls would have to do. Garnett entered with blade unsheathed, covered by his comrades' hunting bows and rifles. The parang, a shortened machete used by the wolves, gleamed in the mist-shrouded moonlight. A few bats fluttered out, disturbed from their pursuit of insects among the rafters. The scout appeared at the loft door and waved the rest in. Valentine led the others inside, fighting a disquieting feeling that something was wrong. Perhaps his Indian blood perceived something tickling below his conscious threshold. He had spent enough time on the borders of the Kurian zone to know that his sixth sense was worth paying attention to, though hard to qualify. The danger was too near somehow, but ill-defined. He finally dismissed it as the product of overwrought nerves. Valentine inspected the sturdy old barn. The water trough was full, which was good, and there were shaded lanterns and oil, which was better. Patel posted the men to the doors and windows. Cracks in the walls of the time-ravaged structure made handy loopholes. The exhausted families threw themselves down in a high-walled inner corner. Valentine trotted to the hayloft ladder and began to climb. The barn's upper level smelled like bat urine. From the loft, he watched his second scout, Gonzalez, backing into the barn, rifle pointed into the darkness. Garnett reported from his perch at the upper door. Gonzo's got wind of him, sir. He always gets bug-eyed when they're around. Three wolves from downstairs joined them in the loft and took positions on each side of the barn. Valentine glanced down through a gap in the loft floor to the lower level, where Patel talked quietly to Gonzalez in the dim light of a screened lantern. Both glanced up into the loft. Gonzalez nodded and climbed the ladder. Sir, Sarge wanted me to show you this. He extended a filthy and stinking piece of cloth drawn from his pocket. 